Thanks, Joel. Um, so we're really excited to, um, to share with you. And right off the bat, almost all the information that we're giving you is from a book um, that I found about 18 months ago called Learning from Henry Nouwen and Vincent Van Gogh, A Portrait of the Compassionate Life. So um, if any of you all know me, I love Henry Nouwen. He's, he's one of my spiritual heroes. Um, he's also uh, one of the fathers of spirituality in the 20th century and um, was a professor at Yale and also at Harvard. And um, the author of this book, Carol Berry, um, was a student of his. And um, Henry came to, to really have a passion for Vincent van Gogh and, and Vincent's compassionate life. And so um, after Henry's death, Carol was given access to some of Henry's lectures on Vincent van Gogh. And um, she is also one who has uh, kind of followed Vincent um, traveled around Europe, going to places that he studied, places that he lived. And so she has taken what Henry's learned from Vincent and what she and what she knows about Van Gogh and and just she's woven it together in this beautiful book with with insights from Henry um, now when on um, compassion and contemplation, and then also insights about Van Gogh and his life journey of compassion, creativity, and struggle. First of all, I really want to thank Joel. Um, he's just a master at what he does, and we appreciate it so much. And I also want to thank Peggy Mackey that helped me out getting some things ready. And a huge thank you to Belina for being here once again on the master class. It's always so fun to be with you. And speaking of Belina, um, I want to start out with a story about Belina and some other folks too. Um, about 22 years ago now, my middle son, Adam, came home from school one day. He was about in the third grade and he said, Mom, I was in art class today and we we learned about this man called Vincent Van, Van Gogh. And he had all these pictures and they were just so amazing. And you know, I thought, wow, what an art teacher to just let them fall in love with an artist like that. That's amazing. And I continued to do what I was doing. And then he comes over to me and he says, and mom, his works are gonna be in Washington DC next week, can we go? And I thought about it and I said, well, yeah, let's do it. Let's go to DC. We were living in Waynesboro, Virginia at the time. So it was kind of a hike, but not too bad. And then the next thing you know, my older son Ross wanted to go. And then my younger son Zachary. So it was Ross, Adam, and Zachary. And then my mother in law wanted to go, who was staying with us, Mary Wood. And then I thought, well, we have to have an artist extraordinaire. So I said, Delina, come with us too. So we loaded up my van, got everybody together, and we headed off to Washington, DC. We got one room, we all piled into it, and uh, we knew that we had to get there early the next morning because they didn't give tickets out for anything ahead of time, so you had to be there to get them. So we were there in the freezing cold at six o'clock in the morning on wash the streets of Washington, D.C., and my poor little mother-in-law was just shivering and everything, but we stayed, and we stayed for a while, and we were the first in line. And then little by little, people started trickling in all descriptions, all ages, all looks, all of these people coming to see the work of Vincent Van Gogh. It was just absolutely incredible to think about. And it was so wonderful to be a part of that and to be a part of exactly what he had done and to see how everybody just appreciated his work so much. And so we saw it, it was fabulous, we totally enjoyed it. And then flash on years later, just this past um, summer, I was able to actually go to this other display, which was amazing, which they also have now in Charlotte, Charlotte North Carolina, where it's huge pictures of Van Gogh all over the place with just this music playing gorgeously. And it's a huge room like he actually lived in that you can walk into. It was an amazing experience. 
And I was there with my daughter-in-law, Andrea, and my grandson, Gideon, that was another generation just falling in love with Van Gogh all over again. So Van Gogh, what do you think about when you think about Van Gogh? Have you ever done one thing in your life, just one thing, that you really, really wished you hadn't have done, that you're noted for your entire life and nothing else? Well, I want to say I'm here to tell you I know what you think of when you think of Van Gogh. Well, forget that. We're not going to talk about that at all. It's not going to come up and erase it from your mind. The only thing I want you to think about when you think about Van Gogh is compassion. Compassion. When you get to the end of what we're saying tonight, one word, compassion. It's up to you, Belina. So, um, so it's very interesting that um, the, the I think the perspective that we're taking with with Van Gogh tonight, because this is not really an art history uh, lesson or class. It's really about compassion and about seeing through the eyes of Henry Nouwen and Vincent Van Gogh. So no one had ever really studied uh, Van Gogh from the perspective of, of, of art and ministry um, before now one and um and yet vincent uh really addressed questions in his paintings that are centered on ministry he asked questions about suffering and death about immortality forgiveness and redemption questions about poverty loneliness and despair as well as a conscious and visible life of compassion and hope that's that's what he lived um and vincent strove to be for a greater understanding of the spiritual dimension of life. He desired a clearer view of how art and religion had the power to console. And he worked to reveal how, to, how the creative experience and process can lead to a greater love of creation and one another. So now one saw Vincent searching for love. And this makes Vincent very relatable because we are all searching for love. Vincent faced many struggles as we all do. And through Nowen's eyes and the writings of Carol Berry, we come closer to the understanding of Vincent van Gogh's heart. So Vincent wanted to become a pastor. His father was a pastor and his grandfather was a pastor. He had grown up visiting people um, through the parish and saw um, many living in poverty. And Vincent did not want to be set apart from those in poverty. He wanted to embrace those who suffered. He loved to embrace those who suffered, and he was thinking about going into ministry. And so um, ministry, he really saw from his father, not so much from his grandfather. He didn't know him real well, but he saw with ministry, it was a lonely existence. And Henry agreed with this. It's, it's a lonely existence sometimes being in the ministry. And so one of the first things as Henry was kind of thinking, I mean, Vincent was kind of thinking along drawing, he, he, he made this sketch of pollard trees. And to pollard a tree is actually to cut the top of it off and just make it grow thicker at the bottom. And that these trees are pollard. And so he loved the look of it. He loved the feel of it. And as you look at these trees though, and you look very closely, you actually discover there are lonely people among these trees. If you look very carefully, you can see a woman over on the left and a man over on the right, and they're all alone. And that's the way it was in his life. He was alone. And then also there was a sketch that he did of a hut. And it was a hut that he had where he envisioned a man sitting by the fireplace as smoke went out of the chimney. And this man was in there all alone. Once again, in his sketches, when he began, he saw people alone and isolated from the rest of the world. After he sketched for a while, um, he really became really more interested in art and he actually began working at an art studio when he was 16 years old he worked at an as an art courier 
Um, he would take paintings different places and he got to know the world of art better and better. And during this time, he was just constantly drawing sketches after drawing sketches. And it was a time that he really kind of grew in, in learning more about art, learning more about what he wanted out of art for himself and what he could give to others through his art. After he did this for a while, he, he decided he wanted to, he had that bug again, and he wanted to go back into the ministry. He thought about going back into the ministry. And Vincent was really a very intelligent fellow. He, at that age, he could speak French, he could speak um, English, and he could speak Dutch. Um, he was very intelligent. He was so intelligent that when he was young, he actually would collect bugs and he would, with the bugs, put Latin names underneath these bugs, um, which seems kind of unusual that he would pick up this Latin, but he would have kind of an, a, 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 a foot in the door with Latin. So it seemed like something that he could just go on and be a part of working toward his um, degree or being, becoming ordained in the ministry. But he just decided he couldn't do it. He just couldn't get through the Latin, which was required during that time. So he didn't exactly know what he was going to do with his life. And he, when he was kind of waiting around, he was back home for a while. And then all of a sudden, he came in touch with these folks that were sending out missionaries. And you didn't have to be ordained to be a missionary. You just wanted to be carrying the word of God to the people. And so that's exactly what Vinson did. Vinson was assigned to work among the miners in this region that was absolutely desperate. It really was a situation where it was darkness all the time. It was like 23,000 men and women worked in the mines, joined by almost 8,000 children and teenagers. The shifts averaged 12 hours and the mine workers rarely saw sunlight. The sanitary conditions in the mines were subhuman. The air in the shafts and the galleries were putrid and hot and little was done to ensure the miners' safety. Medical and social aid was non-existence for the many victims of mining accidents and explosions. The population was ravaged by many different kinds of ailment, including malnutrition, respiratory diseases, typhoid fever, and tuberculosis. Alcoholism was rampant, causing further hardship that threatened the fragile fabric of family life. Children, because they had little or no access to formal education, were left no alternative but to follow their fathers into the mines when they became strong enough to work, thus perpetuating the cycle of poverty and destitution. Vincent had truly come to a people who literally walked in darkness. Vincent started preaching to these folks and uh, they would have a little bit of time that they were allowed to come to service. And so he would preach to them, those who would show up. And um, he just tried his best. He knew the Bible very well. He it was very learned in the Bible and he would talk to them and, and preach to them. And he, felt really all of a sudden like this just wasn't right. This was not what he was called to do. He wasn't called to stand behind a pulpit while these men and children were going down into the mines. He was called to be among these people, to be with them, to be a part of them. So he actually went down into the mines with them. He said, I will work by your side. I will be a companion with you. I will be compassionate for you. I will have compassion and I will show you that I am standing beside you in solidarity. The manner and focus of Vincent's ministry changed. He increasingly after that point 
when he wasn't even in the mines with them, visited the miners in their homes. Wherever he discovered empty cupboards and hungry children, he shared his own meager rations of food. Despite being worn out himself, he often sat for hours at the bedside of sick miners to pray with them and to give them some relief to their wives. He used his last shirt to dress the wounds of a miner who had been seriously hurt in the mine and who had been given up for lost. Thanks to Vincent's selfish and devoted attention, the man was nursed back to health. Vincent tore his bed linens to make bandages for miners who had been injured in fire damp explosions. After being reprimanded for destroying his sheets, he told the wife of the baker he boarded with, oh, Esther, the good Samaritan did more than that. Why not apply in life what one admires in the pages of the Bible? And Esther, he said one more time, one should do like the good God. From time to time, one should go down and live among his own. And you know what happened? He was there living among the people. He was worshiping with them, beside them. He was telling them about the gospel and showing them the gospel. And what happened with the people who sent him out as a missionary? They cut him off. They said, no, that is not what it means to be a pastor or a missionary. You're not supposed to be among the people. You're supposed to be telling them about God. And Vincent saw it differently. He didn't see it about telling them about God. He saw it about walking with them and coming down to earth with them, down below the earth into to the darkness where they were. He actually became an activist for the miners, and he actually worked in helping the mines to become better by his efforts in helping the miners. What you see now in front of you is a picture of miners in the snow. And when he was working in the mines, what he would do is he would pick up pieces of coal, charcoal, and he finds scraps of paper and he would, that's how his work was, what his art was during that time, which I think is just absolutely fabulous to think what he was doing and how he used the gifts that God laid in front of him to show compassion to the people. So Vincent eventually left the mines and was totally alone. Um, he didn't go home and for eight months he didn't even correspond with his brother. Um, Theo was Vincent's brother and closest confidant, and he wrote over 650 letters to him in his lifetime. In one particular letter, Vincent wrote that their father had once reassured him when he was feeling particularly downcast that melancholy does not hurt, but makes us see things with a holier eye. All of Vincent's letters were saved, which is a beautiful treasure. Henry Nowen was given these letters to read and study to get to know Van Gogh more fully as a person. Even though the mine had been hell on earth, Vincent saw the light, even if it was dimly shining. He was able to find beauty and hope in all. He expressed this sentiment often by quoting one of his favorite Bible verses, which is um, 2 Corinthians 6, 610 being forever sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Vincent penned a most moving letter to Theo and used wonderfully descriptive metaphors for the liberation of an imprisoned soul. He writes, what molting is for birds when they change their feathers, that is what adversity or misfortune, the difficult times are for us human beings. One can say in it, in that time of molting, or one can also emerge from it as if renewed. But anyhow, it must not be done in public. It is not at all amusing. It is not pleasant. Therefore, the best thing to do is to go into hiding. Well, so be it. Emerging from his molting time, Vincent still kept his resolve to do his real work among the people the poor and the desolate, destitute, as well as that of spreading the gospel message. But he had to find a way to connect his ministry 
with his desire to take up his drawing pencil. Henry hoped that through discover, discovering Vincent, he would find in him a guide and companion in living out the compassionate life and a support when facing times of deep struggle. Henry said that Vincent invites us to immerse ourselves in living our life to the fullest. What a beautiful encouragement. For Henry, Vincent is an excellent example of the compassionate life and of consolation. The compassionate manifest their consolation by feeling deeply the wounds of life. Vincent said, I couldn't draw sorrow if I didn't feel it myself. The experience of the mind transformed Vincent. Vincent. And then Vincent, um, after those eight months of being alone, he moved back in with his parents for a while and then moved to The Hague. This was not in like Norfolk's Hague. It was rather rough and had many struggling people. CN was one of these people. And CN um, is, uh, it, go back, yeah, that's CN there. Um, one of the more discreet drawings of CN. CN um, was a prostitute and she had um, a baby and then was pregnant with uh, another man's baby. Um, she modeled for Van Gogh and uh, Van Gogh's parents, of course, did not approve of this. And yet, this is when Van Gogh began to really see the pain and strife in the people he drew. He opened a studio and let many street people come and live there with him. These people were poor in spirit. Van Gogh loved um, to sh and shared experiences of life that were not hypocritical, hypocritical, artificial, and superficial. He concluded, um, and Henry concluded his talks about compassion and consolation with these words. I want to read these to you. They're very powerful. No one wants to increase his or her pain, but rather invite the hurting person to come to a place, our own place, where the pain is less. For going down into the deep pain of another is like jumping into a bottomless abyss, not knowing if or when one will land. The grasp under pain means letting go of our own safety limb and falling down to an unknown place. In this place, we maybe won't have the answers that will help or alleviate the pain or explain it. We have to be willing to admit then and there, down in the pit, that we too are helpless and weak and powerless. And who wants to do that or to be there? Um, when I read these words, I think about um, uh, one of our contemporaries, Brene Brown, that talks about compassion and um, empathy. Uh, and, and I think that um, Henry's words uh, rang, ring true, and I think he, um, he and Brene would be good friends. Um, he, he also writes, Vincent did, not, did that and was there with CN and the people of the almsgiving houses and soup kitchens. And Henry added, for most often, we won't have the answers. More importantly, we would be a presence. And so that, that need to be present um, was so very important to Vincent. And then also so very important in Henry's writings to be present with the other, especially the other who's, who you're suffering with. Vincent did not have the answers for CN, but he, he treated her with tenderness and esteem. He believed he could change her own perception of herself. She had never known goodness. How then sh could she be good and lead a wholesome life? And then Vincent wrote to Theo, I must also change so much in myself so that in me, she has an example of diligent work and patience. And that is damned difficult brother to behave in such a way that one can model behavior for someone else. I often also fall short. I have to improve myself to become something better in order to awaken in her the desire to do the same. He was not acting in a superior way, but exposed his own vulnerability to her. Writing to Theo, he assured him that they both needed each other. So eventually, um, Vincent left CN and returned to his parents' home. Um, there he was drawn to watch uh, the peasants working in the field. And he also found a home of weavers. Um, in discovering the weavers, he found their work to be very powerful. 
he envisioned them as slaves to a machine. So seeing the loom as the as a prison metaphorically and in the prison of poverty, literally. So if you see, if, if you look at this, this painting here, you see the weaver and um, Vincent is very, um, he wants you to see um, not only that this, this person is part of the machine, but they're kind of not only slaves to the machine, but slaves to the poverty that keeps them in the machine. Uh, and so from this experience, he created a series of paintings of the weavers. Vincent then, if you, if you see in the weavers started using just a tiny touch of just not sketching, but we're, we're seeing just a little bit of color. And that goes on a little bit further as we see the next picture that we're gonna look at. And it's a picture, you see in the color a little bit, it's even the red up there in the light. This is a picture that I walked into the museum that morning in DC and it's the first one I saw. And I thought, wow, look at that. Look at that, it is absolutely amazing. The faces are almost a little distorted and you can't quite figure it out. What's going on here? And the name of this is called the Potato Eaters. And what is happening in this is it is just the family eating together after they have been in the fields all day long digging out potatoes. They are eating what they have used their hands to dig out of the earth, out of the soil, and it's brought to the table. They all have faces that are just, just thinking, they're thinking deeply. So I see that sore, the eyes looking up at the person on the end. And then look at the hand that has a piece of potato that is being passed to the next person. And it is absolutely amazing when you look at this picture to see that this has transformed into something very sacred. This is the Eucharist. If you look at it, you can see that around the table as a family joins together in the name of Christ is how Vincent saw this as the Eucharist, the communion which we have as the communion of saints. And we all partake of, of in our church today and remember it. He wanted to capture everything that their work worn faces and calloused hands did. He wanted to express the attitude and frame of mind of any family of peasants sitting down to eat their meager supper inside a dark smoke filled cottage. This uplifted a simple communal meal to a level of extraordinariness. Potato eaters became the Eucharist. So after this time, um, Vincent, then went to Belgium to study art. He wasn't there long, and then he went to live with his brother Theo in Paris. Once again, thinking about compassion, the compassionate offer comfort by pointing beyond the human pain to glimpses of strength and hope. And then Vincent went on to say, in a picture, I want to say something comforting as music is comforting. When Vincent reached France, light and color and beauty came forth. They pointed to the divine source that could dispel the darkness and offer hope. So you see in this picture how very different his painting began because of the influence of the other artists that he ran into, but also because he really wanted to, to communicate um, the sense of beauty and color that he sees deeply in, in nature and in other people. So Henry Nouwen said, Vincent had found a way to make our common bond visible, light, color, beauty. This is the common bond. Vincent felt that the deepest religious experience could be born by actual observation and personal experience. So Henry Nouwen um, had entered so deeply in Vincent's world that he had discovered how Vincent consciously used all his senses in this search for God. While working in the deep 
on the damp soil of Holland, walking for hours along country lanes in England, or living among the homeless and the destitute, Vincent's mind and soul were constantly searching for and questioning the presence of God. This was what drew Henry to Vincent on, the, on an even deeper level. Henry saw how Vincent was blending all that he had experienced into his expressive paintings, where he could freely interpret what his senses perceived. Vincent responded to the bright sun, which intensified his perceptions by person, personalizing what he saw, the struggle of the gnarled olive trees and the maturing of the golden wheat where nature's qualities mirrored were mirrored by his own experiences. Nature was revealing itself to him. All that surrounded him was quenching his sensuous and earthly longing for God. All of creation seemed to permeate with God's presence. Vincent, as a true contemplative, could see beyond the surface of things and reveal the metaphorical implications of the material world. And we'll go ahead after the olive trees and take a look at the wheat fields and the countrysides how beautiful that they are. And it was an interesting thing. If you see the cypress tree, the huge cypress tree, um, that is something that Van Gogh painted a lot. And I thought it was actually interesting that in Rome, the, um, or in Italy, the cypress tree means welcome. But actually for Van Gogh, it meant death because cypress trees were so often in the cemeteries and um, he thought of death when he saw the cypress trees. But if you can look at that painting, let's, let's look a little bit at the clouds, how they're swirling just a little bit. Is this making you think of something possibly? I don't know. Let's look at the next trim, countrysides. And here we see once again, nature just calling out to Vincent and just saying, paint me. I want to have just the, the common man out there that is plowing his fields into the trees and everything we go in the skies and we're seeing him again just learning how to work a little bit with that color and the nuances that the color will bring you know vincent did have his demons he really did and we all have our crosses to bear and Vincent just sometimes just had a difficult time with his emotions and with his feelings and with being depressed. And we don't exactly know what was going on in his mind. We just know that beauty was coming out of his mind. But Vincent was placed into an asylum for a while, but out of that asylum, asylum came just, just gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful things. You see right here where he lived in the asylum, the, um, the picture on the left is the halls of the asylum, and the one in the middle you see is um, the room in where he actually lived, and it was a pleasant room, and the room had bars on the windows, but he painted around the bars, and he also had an adjoining room to this room, which was a studio for him that they let him paint. Um, and you know, in, a, in an interesting way, it became kind of a, a haven for him to not be bothered by other things, to not have to think about his next meals, to not have to really do anything, but just focus in on being a, a person who thinks about life, thinks about the world, living and just has contemplation morning noon and night and we have the very wonderful wonderful um success the um, wonderful what word am i looking for we have the wonderful things of pictures and wonderful art and everything that come from this room and if you see on the right this is the outside of the asylum itself and Vincent painted some of the most symbolic and wonderful things that he was working on during this time when he was in the gardens, especially of the asylum. These paintings could inspire us to become contemplatives also when you look at some of these paintings. Here it was that Henry discovered deep 
calling to deep. You may recognize that from Psalms 42, seven. Benson had somehow transcended art and become an mediator. Henry understood that Benson's art had become an act of hospitality. Benson invited people to experience their connectedness with creation and the whole of human existence. Henry explained that to the, to the, to creation and the whole of existence, Henry explained that to the very end, Vincent pursued the great mystery that hides behind the appearance of created things. This was the secret he labored so hard to reveal in his paintings, namely that the divine was present in all the realities of life. The divine was present in all the realities of life. And we can see that for ourselves. The divine is present in everything. Vincent's art was imbued with his experiences of fully tasting these realities. Simple in images of Vincent's painted sores, for example, express metaphorically that when the ground is broken, new seeds can be sown. Henry interpreted this metaphor, one of his favorites, by saying that through acknowledging our brokenness, acknowledging our brokenness, we are able to come to new insights. When people reach out to each other in mutual openness, in mutual suffering, tensions evaporate, smiles shine through tearful eyes, and the presence of something new and eternally fresh is sensed. New life can emerge from brokenness. Henry understood through in-depth study of Vincent's life that indeed a renewed purpose and joy in life comes forth from the fellowship of those who are wounded and weak. The vulnerable have so much to teach about the reality of life and our connection as finite beings. Henry explained that this is the comfort Vincent offered. It was a solace to Henry and to his wounds too. Henry's insight was captivated. He made us realize that in his paintings, Vincent pointed beyond the struggles of daily life to the source of abounding strength and comforting hope. It's... Um... This book is so beautiful because it really does weave together Vincent's thinking and, and Henry Nouwen's thinking. And it's so, they're so extremely creative. And one of the things that I love about, about Vincent's paintings, and I really didn't, I mean, I've enjoyed Vincent van Gogh and his paintings for years, but to really kind of understand his life a little more helps me see that what Vincent's trying to do in all of his drawings and all of his paintings is to allow you to see not only what he sees, but also allow you to see him because he's, he's revealing himself um, in, in all these drawings and paintings that he's done over his life. So, um, uh, Vincent wrote to Theo that he would wrestle with nature until she reveals her secret to me. Already then he sensed all that was visible in nature was bound to a greater invisible creative source. And looking at things for a long time made him realize that the temporal and observable pointed to the eternal and the invisible. Do you remember seeing the pictures like of Sion when... Um when Vincent was at the Hague, it, it was dark. It was it was finding the sorrow in life, uh, the coal miners. It was finding the the bleakness and the darkness and the and the things that really made people feel hurt inside. Mm -hmm. Wow! But in the monastery, he found beauty. He found color, like you had discovered in Paris, and it just exploded in the monastery. Look at this first picture. It's found in the sanctuary garden, the beautiful garden that we have. The sanctuary garden is where his beautiful iris painting came into being. Crouched among the blooming irises growing there, Vincent studied them face to face and drew them from his vantage point of intimacy. He celebrated their distinctive beauty, not by rendering them in a realistic manner, but by expressing their essence, their irisness. 
And can't you see how beautiful they are and how he just absolutely made them look the way he saw them, the way he can make people see them and the, the way other people could enjoy them. And then um, Joel, if you'll go to the next painting, the field with the reaper, back one, there you go. Um, so, so these sowers and reapers connected Vincent to his lifelong familiarity with the cycles of sowing and reaping and with the labors of the field. While painting the figure of the reaper as an image of death, he wrote to his brother Theo. I then saw in this reaper a vague figure struggling like a devil in the intense heat to get to the end of his toil. I then saw the image of death and the sense that humanity would be the wheat being reaped. So it is, if you like, the opposite of that sower I tried doing before. But in this death, there is nothing sad. It goes on in full daylight with the sun flooding everything and a light of pure gold. It is an image of death and is spoken in the great book of nature. But what I have sought is the almost smiling. By painting the reaper in full daylight, he aimed to make death the complement to life lived on earth, or as he phrased it, the other side of life. With the almost smiling, he wanted to offer the comforting vision that death was merely a transitioning into the unseen part of life and that it happened in broad daylight under the loving embrace of the sun's rays. And I, I wish so much that we could transport all of you to an actual painting of Van Gogh's because, because the, the, um, the pictures of the paintings do not do this color justice. The, the color of the wheat, the color of the sun is absolutely overwhelming and it draws you in. And I love the fact that Vincent is drawing us in to, to, to death and saying to us, look, death is not the end. Death is not the end, but, but only the beginning and death happens in full daylight. And then if you go to the next painting, um, this one is, is much more uh, crude and, um, and, um, and draws you in in a different way. And it draws, draws us into to Vincent struggling. So after recovering from seizures and feeling strong enough to paint, Vincent was given an, given an attendant who accompanied him into the countryside surrounding the monastery. His forays beyond the confining walls led him to discover an old marble quarry with large tumbling boulders and a steep ravine carved deeply through the rock. But of these places, once fixed on canvas, mirrored his brokenness as well as his intense willpower to research. It is as if Vincent invites the viewer to experience the discomforts of his illness and then to join him in his effort to emerge from the depths of his pain. Vincent wrote that at times he painted with an amazing lucidity, standing before nature scenes of breathtaking beauty. Time stood still for him then. He was painting as if in a trance. Nature spoke and Vincent responded, responded intuitively. His, refer his reverence, his awe, his love for nature was expressed in every piece of art as a loud proclamation of the presence of the divine. And ladies and gentlemen, what you've all been waiting for more than likely is coming up next. Swirls and spirals. Vincent wrote, when the sound ceased, God's voice is heard under the stars. The image of pulsating night sky has entered into the mainstream of our art culture in the Western world. All the blues from light to deep are colored by that, that wonderful look that they have. Their nature recedes away from the viewer and thus draws us into the painting where we are caught among the swirling spirals and circles. Ordinarily, the fathomless expanse of the night sky doesn't appear to us that way, the way Vincent painted it. Through photo no photographers taken by the Hubble telescope 
of spiral shaped galaxies in deep space have a striking resemblance. Thus, Van Gogh's, Van Gogh's I mean, thus Vincent's painting leads us to think of those spectacular images. But the silhouette of a dark Dutch village church and surrounding college cottages, see in the middle, look at the bottom, you see the church with their lighted windows make the painted seem too earthy to be able to imagine visible galaxies. So we are beckoned to look beyond the obvious to a sign language that surpasses our ordinary rational way of thinking. The painting was created while Vincent was feeling homesick for the North and remembering a phrase spoken long ago by a pastor he had heard speak and who he felt had the feeling of an artist in the true sense of the word. For instance, when he said, every night the moon came whispering to me what she had seen in the silent, silent night. Contemplating the deep blue night sky with the sparkling light of moon and stars brought back the sentiments these words had elicited, had elicited and which had made him write to Theo, Theo years ago. The moon is still shining and the sun and the evening star, which is a good thing. And they also often speak of the love of God and make one think of the words, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. I want to tell you quickly one last little story. Um, keep Starry Night up because I want you to see the beauty of this story and actually think of the words that I'm going to say to you. One thing that the people that have not really looked into his life and heard more about his life, think about that Vincent actually committed suicide and shot himself. But the true story is he was shot in the lung and he went back to where he was. They had let him go out for a walk and he came back and he was on the bed and he died four days later. And as time went on, they found out that no, he had not committed suicide, that a group of young boys in the village had always made fun of him and really gave him a hard time, ridiculed him and they had shot him. So at the end, he was actually magnanimous in his death and he had compassion until the very end. And what a beautiful way to think of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Vincent. Paul Tillich, a philosopher and theologian seemed to capture when he, when he wrote, all art creates symbols for a level of reality which cannot be reached in any other way. A picture and a poem reveal elements of reality which cannot be approached scientifically. In the creative work of art, we encounter reality in a dimension which is closed to us without such works. Vincent's art had become nature's most worthy interpreter. He wrote in his last letter to Theo, Theo ah, really, we can only make our pictures speak. Beautiful. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that up for a minute. Um, Cheryl and Valina, thank you so much for um, for sharing this with us. Um, we are so blessed to have uh, have you and have your have your your passion and dedication to um, to putting this all together. Um, you know, it, it strikes me, um, we don't have any any questions or um, any follow up comments in the chat. Um, you, you both did such a, a beautiful job um, in presenting this. And it, it strikes me, um, especially last week, Joyce did a, an amazing presentation on Bach and Beethoven, and especially in Beethoven's life, this um, this kind of charted descent into into madness as he lost his hearing and his work got darker. Um, and this evening, it struck me how Vincent's work seemed to go from this isolation and, and loneliness um, and darkness of charcoal to this beautiful image of light um, and this sort of um, presentation, this 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 divineness that was always um, always present in Vincent's work. 
So thank you both for putting this together. And it's really a, a gift to, to look at um, Henry Nowen's uh, reflections of that. So um, I, I, on that note, um, I wanna put a link back in the chat. So for anyone that's interested in, in reading more and, and diving in deeper, um, it's certainly worth the, the time uh, to do so. And there's a link in the chat window to Amazon. You can purchase the book or you can get information on the book um, that Blaine and Cheryl um, shared earlier. Uh, I think I can show you the cover of it. Um, so you know what it looks like, there it is. Um, and I, I encourage you to, to check it out, to dive in. And while that is up, um, before we wrap up for this evening and, and say good night, um, Belina and Cheryl, if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a, a anything, final takeaway thought, um, something perhaps that uh, really impacted you or resonated with you or a big takeaway um, for you in, in exploring side by side, Henry Nowen and Vincent Van Gogh, uh, as you prepared for this evening, what, what, what impacted you? What are your big takeaways? Um, I would think my takeaway would be um, the patience and love that Henry had for Vincent. Um, he, he didn't just toss him aside as some crazy person that did you know what. He actually really delved into his heart and soul and went from the very start to the very finish and just saw what made him tick and what made him a true child of God. Now, I think for me, the um, the opportunity to to read um, what Henry thinks about Vincent, and then to hear more about Vincent's story, uh, really opened my eyes to um, why he drew, why why he painted what he painted, and um, just the he's. There, I mean, there's so many artists out there that allow you to see the world as they see it. And what I love about Vincent is that he went from this darkness that Joel, that you're talking about to, to this just light, this day that even, even death is in the sunlight. And um, that's such a beautiful proclamation of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both. Um, I know many people have Starry Night as a refrigerator magnet. I've seen it on t-shirts. I've seen it on calendars, um, but I'll never look at it the same way again, um, especially after this evening. So thank you both for, um, for that rich gift and that, that deep, deep dive into um, Vincent Van Gogh and Henry Nouwen. Um, the book is there, and I know both, um, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm, I'm sure that Belina and Cheryl would also both recommend any of um, Henry Nouwen's writings as well. Um, Absolutely. Beautiful, yep. beautiful stuff. Yeah. And I and I would third that uh, recommendation um, as well. So, um, Valina, Cheryl, thank you again so much. This was uh, so beautiful and very well done. And um, we thank you for for sharing that gift with us this evening. Thank and you.